Okay. <clears throat> Actually, let me get my... Uh, let's get the headphones on, shall we? So we can maybe play some sound if we want to play some sound here. We're going to talk about... Uh, we're going to take a little break from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine-Russia situation. And there's some other stuff of note. Actually, something that I'm finding uh, very, 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 very interesting. Probably shouldn't show this on the stream, should I, right? Like I really care that much? Not really. It's just little old me. I'm nobody. I'm just a fucking boiler mechanic who loves history. And who makes a lot of good, correct calls. Oh, what didn't work? Didn't work. Well, you motherfucker. Why is that? Oh, because my phone is suck is taking my Bluetooth, huh? So. Let's get this connected. So. What is going on? Why won't this motherfucker connect? Didn't look like your Bluetooth device is still discoverable. What do you mean it's not discoverable? Okay. I'm trying to connect my Bluetooth headphones to my cheap Bluetooth headphones to uh, the computer so I can, you know, maybe... Uh, like if I want to play sound, because I got some videos. We got some videos from China. There's a lot of stuff coming out from China. So they, ah, we're connected. Fantastic. So we have um, today, what kind of uh, Inspired me to do this quick live. It's Saturday. It's a beautiful day here in South Florida. We had a cold front or something, and we're at like the low 80s, high 70s. Uh, just fantastic. Probably our last nice day before the dark dog days of summer come around. Uh, <clears throat> so most people might be aware there is... Uh, they're having a COVID breakout in China. And I guess it's really spreading this time. And it's kind of odd to me because my 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 feeling on the whole situation these last couple of years is that China. So my, my assumption uh, regarding China and COVID over the last couple of years was that China did indeed have... Uh, huge outbreaks but they somehow contained uh the information and uh really had a good control over the spread of the information of the uh of the covid break of the covid pandemic in other words i'm saying that My feeling was that China probably had some bad outbreaks during the COVID, uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Probably lost a lot of people, probably, uh, and, and seemed to have done a good job at covering up. But now that kind of puts this into doubt. That kind of, I'm kind of like really in doubt. My, 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 uh, my belief in that is shaken because right now COVID, they're having a what would seem to be a mild outbreak. I mean, in Shanghai, they have, according to this map, which was released a few days ago, actually. Uh, they had 70,000 plus people who confirmed had COVID in Shanghai. As most people might know, Shanghai's been under, parts of Shanghai have been under very very draconian lockdowns let's remember that in uh the beginning of the outbreak there they were welding people into their houses 
it looks like they've returned to those sorts of policies. And um, as we let me uh, maybe get my other Twitter out because I want to show keep that map up. And let's show this uh, some threads here that I saved on my anarcho-capitalist Twitter. So we have stuff like this going on in China. This is, looks like a relatively small uh, protest. Those guys in those suits and the bun those are those are called those are called bunny suits, by the way. Uh, I hate them. Uh, you sweat your ass off in these bunny suits. Um, it's kind of creepy, kind of ridiculous looking. But yeah, this is a small protest shared by Jack Posobiec. Then we have. That's Peru. That's one. That's Peru. What's going on here? Oh, this was a good one. Oh, this is this is. I just this is great. This just gets my anarchist. Uh, this just gets me excited as an anarchist. Look at this. Now this is much more serious situation. I would say definitely a more serious situation going on here. I guess they're looting, they're taking food because they're hungry. So, I guess they were locking people in their houses and people weren't able to get food and government's basically acting like, you know, tough luck. Uh, the whole thing was these people in these neighborhoods, and I believe it's just certain neighborhoods in Shanghai, are locked down. And they're being forced to say, stay in their apartment. Now, according to Lao Wai, which is a source uh, for China's information, I'm not going to say he's, I trust, you know, he's definitely biased, but I, I, I trust him as a source, but he has his biases. He actually fled China because the government was coming after him. So, you know, I would say he's probably a little biased, but he was showing videos of, the government putting barbed wire in stairwells and apartments so that people couldn't get out and people climbing out, uh, scaling buildings, scaling down their buildings so they can get out so they can go find food. And so the delivery situations were well, so what's happening is people are being forced to seek delivery services for food. And those delivery services are not only not reliable, but a lot of times uh, the food would be stolen, like the delivery service would come to the uh, entrance of a building because most people live in apartments in a place like Shanghai. Uh, I'm sure anybody that owns a house in Shanghai probably uh, wouldn't have to worry about lockdowns, obviously, because they're rich. Um, but uh, they would leave the food at on the at the foot of the, you know, at the entrance to the building, the apartment building, and uh, the food would be stolen, and people are literally starving, apparently, so they say. And there's just a lot of cool images coming out in China. So here, this is uh, people looting, searching for food. Now, China has protests all the time. It's not like there's no protests in China. And usually those protests have to do with the people upset about living conditions or not getting paid enough or something like that um you know the idea if you so so let me think about this one thing about china we have to understand this would be a good segue for this one thing we have to understand about China. Let's see if I had saved this. Uh, saved this. Uh, sure didn't, did I? Okay. So. 
So there's scattered small rebellions uh, throughout China all the time, as I mentioned. China has, I love Chinese history. Forgive me, but I'm gonna sh I'm going to display a, uh, Wikipedia art in a minute. Let's see what else we got here. I think there was another good China uh, China uh, rebe uh, protest video somewhere, but maybe I didn't. I think it was Duneberg. Duneberg has been putting out some good ones. Duneberg. That's this is Peru. Peru's been having protests as well due to uh inflation. Maybe I'll round off this conversation with uh a little insight into that. But uh Here we have a list of rebellions in China. So China is such an amazing such an amazing uh, cultures has such an amazing history. Uh, if we look at China, what we see is a civilization that was able to develop for thousands of years with very little external sort of agitating factors. So it was able to develop and evolve and devolve on its own, independent of the rest of the world until about the 1800s. Um, when you start seeing, you know, the opium wars and all that. And uh, you see, as I've mentioned, as I love to talk about, uh, the mandate of heaven What is a concept. And it's a concept really based around rebellion and civil unrest. And what, ha what the whole concept is, is that when the people are not satisfied with the ruler, whoever that may be, the people... Uh, the, that means that the ruler has lost the mandate of heaven. And we can think of the mandate of heaven as uh, the mandate of the people. Uh, and that gives the civilian population carte blanche to pick up the, the pitchforks and, uh, you know, uh, do what they have to do. And this has been the case in China. This has been sort of a cyclical thing that uh, occurred in China for thousands of years. You have uh, civilizations, dynasties, ruling regimes, usually autocratic ruling regimes with, uh, you know, uh, very, a very heavy emphasis on uh, centralized bureaucracies is what you see a lot of in China. And... Uh, even the Mongols, when they took over China, the Yuan dynasty, uh, at first they were very Mongolian in the way they ruled, but over uh, a century or so, uh, they adapted and assimilated mostly to Chinese culture to the point where uh, the late uh, Mongol rulers of the Yuan dynasty were, in every sense of the word, Chinese. They were Mongolian in name only. They adapted the culture. They adapted the principles of the Chinese, which was a an autocratic uh, regime with a emperor who would be an autocratic ruler. And let's look up uh, the word, you know, because I'm not even 100% on the definition of this. When we say autocratic... Usually we mean like not absolute ruler, but a ruler who it's sort of a, so autocratic, um, very nice. Uh, autocratic means autocratic, huh? Merriam-Webster. Let's see what let's just get a clarification of what autocratic actually means. So absolute, arbitrary, czarist, tyrannical, kind of is synonymous with tyrannical, dictatorial, um, but it has slightly different connotations. Let's see what this uh, free dictionary says. Tending to impose one's will on others in an insistent or arrogant manner, domineering. So autocratic would mean absolutist. An absolute ruler would mean the ruler has absolute 
power. Autocratic doesn't necessarily... So in other words, an absolute ruler, if they want a peasant in... So let's say in China, if you had an absolute ruler, like Mao Zedong was a, basically an absolute ruler, he could tell a peasant in... Guangdong province to do anything he wanted an autocratic ruler can't necessarily do that an autocratic ruler does however have wide-ranging powers and can exercise those powers pretty freely but they don't really have absolute control so a lot of people say Vladimir Putin is an autocratic ruler he doesn't have absolute control of Russia but he does tend to get what he wants uh, when he wants it, uh, with very little resistance uh, most of the time. But in the case of Mao Zedong, who ruled China, he was almost a godlike figure to the Chinese. Anything, if he snapped his fingers, no matter 99.9% .9 of the time, whatever he wanted to happen, okay, would happen. So that's kind of a distinction between autocratic an absolute rule. Um, and in China, you would have autocratic regimes, usually to, uh, ruled by a single sort of uh, feudalistic lord usually there was a nobility of sorts but usually the nobility uh it, whenever you had a major dynasty whether it was the tang dynasty or the ming dynasty zhou 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 or zhou dynasty i don't know how to pronounce it whenever you had such a dynasty um usually the nobles were kept in check so the nobles the aristocracy uh, the estate of nobility, if you want to call it that, it wouldn't have had as much power as in, say, medieval England, for example. But what would always happen in Chinese uh, civilization is a, a dynasty would rule for a period of, a period of time, usually very autocratically, usually things got more and more centralized over time. And then something happens whether it's through the incompetence of the uh uh you know of the regime or whether it was a natural disaster of some sort um you had frequent floods in china especially in what we call the yellow river valley uh yellow river yellow river which I believe is also the Yangtze River. Uh, yellow River, which is yellow in, in parts. That's why they call it the Yellow River, because of all the silt. is a very important place for Chinese history because that tends to be uh, the center of where, uh, Chinese, where civilization in China develops due to the... See, it's actually yellow. Look at that. Um, yellow River... And as you can see, there's farms. So that's usually the where most of Chinese civilization developed. And what they did early on in Chinese history, because they wanted, you know, the Yellow River always flooded because it's getting, it's got a huge drainage basin going all the way to the Himalayas. And uh, it would flood frequently, just like the Nile did. Um, <clears throat> but in order to, and, and see, if you, if you let a... Uh, river naturally flood it tends to be not so devastating because the flooding occurs at much more slowly generally speaking giving people time to uh you know flee if necessary but what they started doing early on in chinese history and in, in, in the history of china was building dikes and levees around the yellow river to control the flooding so that they can farm around that area because it was such great farmland and that's why uh china grew into such a populous country because they always had um plenty of food um 
or they always had it. They didn't always have plenty of food. There were famines, of course. But, you know, because of the farming, you had a, a high population growth. Um, but a lot of times, for example, one thing that often caused uh, civil unrest in China was the uh, those dikes would break. And uh, usually it would be a huge loss of life as a result because then you have very, very fast flooding that occurs. Once a dike breaks, it creates a huge flood, generally speaking, giving people in the area little time to flee. And you'd have these massive floods with tens of thousands of people dying. And if you're talking ancient times, that's a lot of people. Even in the uh, 20th century, I think there was a flood in China uh, that caused a lot of problems. But so the point is, because I'm already getting too sidetracked here. Don't get me started on Chinese history. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the thing is, is uh, whether it was the emperor's fault or not, shit like that starts happening. Droughts. Um, Whatever the case may be, usually the people started getting pissed. Usually it, the blame usually went on to the emperor and his administration because the idea was the emperor was mandated by heaven. And if stuff like that started happening, well, obviously the emperor lost his mandate. The, the mandate has been, has been revoked. And so now once the emperor lost the mandate, uh, it was incumbent upon the people to pick up those pitchforks, impale the motherfucker, and chop off his head. And that happened over and over again in Chinese history. Um, one of the greatest, most amazing, uh, I don't know, one of the most interesting rebellions was the Taiping Rebellion. Um, and that was... Of course, you got to look that up. Anybody has to look that up. The Taiping Rebellion is just amazing. Uh, highest casual, probably the highest casualty civil war in the history of the world. I mean, you have casualty numbers in, in the Taiping Rebellion that look like World War II kind of casualty numbers. Most of those people who died during the Taiping Rebellion, obviously, most of them died due to basically because society and uh, supply chains broke down and people starved to death and there was a lot of disease. Uh, but so China has this history, this spirit of rebellion ingrained in their culture. Indeed, I would r argue that in a way... China always has been and always will be uh, a sort of democracy, but not a democracy by electoral dictum, rather a democracy through the use of force and violence. You can look at the communist revolution of China as another form of an expression of the mandate of heaven. Chiang Kai-shek, uh, he was so corrupt, they used to have a name for him, something like, "Give me, write me a check or something. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, China was subjected to some of the worst, uh, uh, probably the, China suffered as many casualties in World War II uh, arguably is Russia, maybe more. Uh, they fought against the Japanese for the entirety of the war. The Japanese were actually never able to fully conquer China. Uh, tens, tens and tens of millions of people. Some, some may argue, some may say close to a hundred million people. I'm not so sure about that, but, um, China was badly devastated by World War II. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people never hear about that. And uh, so the communist revolution comes about. Pretty much the same thing as always. The people 
without, you know, because, you know, the communists obviously are not going to uh, subscribe to the idea of the mandate of heaven because communists hate religion. After all, religion is a competitor to the cults of personality that they like to build around themselves as Communist Party officials and leaders. But uh, it is the same concept. Uh, the national, the the Kao Mantong, Kao, I don't know how to pronounce it. The Chinese nationalists were seen as uh, uh, not fit to rule. Um, they had lost the mandate of heaven and in come the communists. And it wasn't really, you know... They, the nationalists obviously were were very corrupt, so perhaps it was for the best. Who knows? I would, pro I, I would think so. Actually, I would, I would, you know, as much as I don't like communism as a concept, uh, China's probably better was better off having been. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. I have to back off on that. Mao Zedong was. Uh, you know, responsible, you can argue indirectly or, or directly, it doesn't matter, but responsible for the deaths of 100 million people, perhaps, through his agricultural policies, which he pushed on the people, uh, knowingly, knowing that they would uh, cause huge loss of life, just like Stalin did to the uh, people of the Soviet Union. So, they, uh, the... So the, the nationalist, the Chiang Kai-shek and his regime lost the mandate of heaven and they had to flee to Taiwan. They actually made off better than most uh, Chinese dynasties who uh, had lost their mandate of heaven. Then again, did the nationalists, now I'm just speculating, the nationalists uh, hardly had the mandate of heaven in the first place. They only ruled from the end of the Qing dynasty to... Uh, the 1940s and uh they didn't have a whole lot of control over china you wouldn't actually be able to put them in the same on the same level as a as one of the major chinese dynasties they were kind of like an interim sort of uh regime uh between major uh dynasties they were there between the Qing dynasty and the communist dynasty so We have it. We have this. So I would say, you know, you have this ingrained in Chinese culture to a point where you could almost argue China actually is a democracy. It's just that they don't have elections. Uh, they let a, they let a regime rule until the regime loses the mandate of heaven, and then it's off with their heads. So. <clears throat> Back to the matter at hand here. <clears throat> so you're starting to see problems in Shanghai. Go look at Lao Wai's video. He's doing some good videos on it. Now, he is biased, of course. But he's doing some decent videos. There's information getting out despite all the best efforts of this very sophisticated uh, regime. Very sophisticated they are at controlling information, but it's not enough. It's never enough. You know, when the people get pissed off, when the peasants get out the pitchforks, look out. I don't care how brutal and draconian a regime is or how sophisticated they are. You see, the problem that any any regime faces when dealing with unruly uh, an unruly population is they can only kill so many of them. After all, they need somebody to rule over, to collect taxes from, to uh, force into slavery or whatever they do, which China kind of does all of the above. And so does the U.S., by the way. The U.S. does all of the above as well. Not to, not to, I'm not here to denigrate China at all. I'm not here to cast dispersions on China or I'm not, I'm not even here to cast dispersions on the Chinese government. Look, I'm an, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big L libertarian and anarchist. I say, let China do what it wants to do. Uh, United States has its own problems. 
But I am here to kind of predict uh, possible outcomes here because I, I see something. I got a feeling here. I got this feeling that um, we might see a concurrence in history, so to speak. So Shanghai has uh, an outbreak in these lockdowns and you're starting to see civil unrest. It looks like to be localized, but the problem is is that despite all their best efforts, the Chinese government doesn't have total control of the uh, internet, first of all. And, uh, you know, they're, 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 like all governments, their power, their power is based on legitimacy, first and foremost. The mandate of heaven uh, as I've said many times before, is a uh, is synonymous with legitimacy, the legitimacy of a government. And once a government loses legitimacy, I've probably beaten this dead horse, but it's just one of my favorite concepts. Uh, once a government loses legitimacy, it is powerless. It has no power. And one way to con to keep a hold on or to control legitimacy to maintain legitimacy let's say is to control information but i doubt you know i don't know what's going on in china but i doubt the government has total control over information so you're starting to see things break out in shanghai shanghai is a huge city all it would take would be one hundredth of one percent of those people to have a VPN and start sending videos to other people throughout China. And then you start to see the problem. Now, according to this post, which is really what kind of got me going here. Where is it at? Uh... According to BNO Medriva Newsroom, according to Reuters, okay, so they're saying according to Reuters, at least 23 cities in China on full or partial lockdown covering 193 million people. So, of course, the government of China is going to say, well, yeah, COVID's spreading after all, so we have to lock down. See, here's what happened. So what happened in Shanghai, let's back up a little bit. So what's what? why is there civil unrest besides the fact that people are hungry? But what's another thing? How is the government losing legitimacy? How, what's, what, what else is happening? Well, the government has said time and time again and has tried to convince the people of China that they are so amazing, so powerful, so omnipotent that they can stop the spread of COVID. And so far, they've convinced China and, and maybe even the world. I mean, I never bought it, but uh, most people did that. Oh, yeah, they... They didn't have any COVID outbreaks. And now we're starting to see a an outbreak get out of control. Okay. Now the people of China who did believe the government's bullshit are starting to question it. That's legitimacy being lost. And every grain of sand on the pile, every drop in the bucket brings you closer and closer to a cascade, a tsunami of social unrest. Because without that legitimacy, you know, plus hunger, plus you get people hungry. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, maybe maybe these people should study history a little bit more. I know that I know they do. But you are uh, not only um, losing legitimacy by proving yourself unable to stop COVID and proving yourself a liar, but you're also starving people. I mean, it's almost like they want social unrest. I mean, it's perfect. I mean, you're just putting together a perfect social unrest soup right there. But now people are saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, 
They can't control COVID. Well, you know what? In everybody's mind, that's that that just that just cre that destroys their legitimacy, as I added, and I was gonna say something else. Little little uh brain fart there, but so I think that the reason they're actually shutting down these uh locking down has more to do with the fact that there's social unrest in Shanghai and they're a little and they're they're worried. And what happens when any government gets anxious? When any government gets anxious, what does history teach us? It teaches us that they enact some knee-jerk policy. They act out of instinct, out of emotion, out of fear. See, once the government starts showing their fear, that only further uh, destroys their legitimacy. Now they're starting uh, lockdowns all over China, all over the place. 193 million people, according to Reuters. <sighs> And at the same time, if you got 70,000 people, at least, at the so they say, as of um, April 6th, you had 70,000 people in Shanghai, 20,000 or more or less, more than 20,000 in whatever province that is. You have COVID all over China. According to them, you know, for every for and let's not forget for every case that they have positively tested, you're going to have more, many more that are that are out there that haven't been tested yet. Although I know in China, they their testing regimen is pretty, uh, pretty efficient, but it, it's not there's no way it's foolproof. A lot of people are probably especially in your rural in your rural areas. Uh, you're probably going to have a lot more people in some of these rural areas. I think that's Hunan province there, HN. Hunan province is, uh, there goes Guando, that's Guanzo, Gangski. I don't know how to say them right. But um, <clears throat> in some of these, especially, look, you're going out to the Gobi Desert area. What's that called? Uh, XJ, I don't even know. They're not going to, there's... So there's there's COVID all over the place. It's out of control. There's no way. I'd be very surprised if they'll, if they'll be able to control it. And what happens if you have a major outbreak in China? More loss of legitimacy. Much more. And then the uh, and then what does the government do? What do all governments do in these situations? They double down usually because they can't admit, especially if you're a top down autocracy, which I would call China today more of an autocracy, not an absolutist uh, totalitarian, because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, local governments in China do have a lot of control, de facto control, not 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 de jure control, but de facto they have a lot of it autonomy. So this is an autocratic state and uh they're losing legitimacy i'm gonna make a call here and then i'm gonna end this uh this video i'm gonna leave peru alone for now because that's kind of a different subject but i'm gonna end this video saying that this has a very good chance of becoming the next major Chinese rebellion. You have the COVID spreading, which the hey, the government was supposed to be able to stop that. They told us they were able they this wasn't going to be a problem. They're locking people down and starving them. Now they're going to starve more people. So, they're at the, so COVID starts spreading, they're starving people and locking them down. They start to rebel. Oh, what's their answer to that? See, this just tells you how fucking retarded government is half the time how does it what does the government do of china 
oh, let's do the same thing in several, how many other cities? They said 23 other cities. Because it's not working in Shanghai. There's problems in Shanghai. So let's let's do more of it. <laughs> this is how government works. Because let me end it by saying this. Government <clears throat> is just an institution. And all institutions... All institutions are herds whose behave herds like a herd of wildebeest whose behavior is reduced to the least common denominator so all logic and rationality in an institution goes out the window the least common denominator in human behavior is instinct and emotion okay so all governments will react instinctually emotionally if you have good leadership, I think Dan Carlin was talking about this, which is true. If you have good leadership and that leader can rein everything in and make certain things happen that they want to happen, then they can sort of uh, override the typical instinctual behavior of bureaucracies. And I think Dan Carlin was talking about uh, JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis in that respect. And uh, I would look at Lex Friedman's podcast with him. And I would also recommend to anybody to look at, uh, to check out Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. He did an excellent um, series on the war in the Pacific, which he called uh, Supernova in the East. It's on YouTube. So that's a plug, a free plug for Dan Carlin, who's you know, much more accomplished person than me. So, you know, just doing my part to steer people in the right direction there. But my prediction stands as follows. I give it a better than 50% chance, let's say maybe 60% chance that the protests expand. And uh, I'm sure there's some, you know, United States uh, intelligence already kind of uh, pondering what they want to do. Um, you know, if I was the Chinese government, not to give them any ideas, but I would, uh, I would be really worried right now. Uh, maybe I, I don't know. I'm not going to get into what I would do, but <laughs> as if I were a dictator, I'm imagining what I would do if I were a evil dictator here. So, uh, that's it for, for now. I just wanted to put that out there. I think that this uh, situation can really get out of hand. The government's response of locking down more cities is only going to worsen the situation and cause the unrest to spread. So that's my prediction. Let's see what happens. I'm out.